a shout of praise. Come on. You shouted louder for the Springboks yesterday. Come on, give him a shout of praise this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, come on, let's, uh, before we take our seats, let's welcome someone. Just greet someone. Say, Boka, you're like a dung. Give him on the drug. Amen. Ons bietjie licht kry daar achter. Bietjie donker. Ons moet nie vir haar. Wat is dit met die kerk in die World Cup? Dit is nou twee sonde aan een rij waar die wereld beker duivel ons getref het. Ek moet nou maar net een tykie vat en net sien hierdie het een bietjie verbeter vir oogend. En nou is dit nou weer hierdie kant. Ek versta, met die game was 11 uur die ochend. Wat het die mense gedoen gister? Ek kon al 6 uur in die bed gewees het. Amen. Nou moet ek, dat ek het nou maar net uitkry, dan gaan ek beter preek. Amen. Amen. But, uh, what an amazing day yesterday. Amen. Come on, we can give the Springboks a cheer this morning. Amen. Come on. And, uh, I think the match aside which was a great spectacle and a great match to watch if you were a South African. Um, but I think in years to come, we'll look upon this day and that match the same way we did as we looked upon 1995. I don't really think we fully comprehend the significance of what that did for us as a nation. And we'll see it in the years to come that as a sport that was predominantly known and played only by white people, how we were led by a black captain and a t- with a team comprised of people of all walks of life and all different kinds of colors. And that's a testimony to what we could be as a nation. Amen? That's a testimony to what we could be as a church. So the game is one thing, and winning the game is great. We love winning. But the significance of what that team represents to us as a nation, we have to work towards now as a people. Long after the euphoria has left us of experiencing the win, and I've watched the game a second time already, amen, I, I really have, because I love sport and I love winning, but we have to take that as an example, and we have to take that as encouragement and work towards that as a nation, as a people, amen, and it starts here in a place called Paul, in a place called Wellington, it starts here in this church, amen, that's what we're trying to build as a vision, a church that is multi-generational, a church that is multicultural, that includes all people from all walks of life. Because that is what the church of Jesus Christ would represent in the world today. Amen. Do you agree with me this morning? Amen. That's not my message. I could have just put on the game and we could have had a great time and they would have been preaching enough. But uh, to show you, I've prepared something. Let's preach. Amen. Are you ready for the word? Amen. The title of my message this morning is Run with Endurance. Run with Endurance. And it's a fitting me- message for this time of the year because you might not feel like you want to endure much longer because, let's face it, this year wasn't the greatest, maybe, for us as a people, for us as a nation, maybe for you personally. That might have not been great for, for others. It might have been great, but we've been feeling the pinch and the pressure of an economy that's not doing well, of political uncertainty, etc., 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 and all those things eat away at your endurance. They want you to make, make you to give up, and you struggle to hold on, and you struggle to stay in the fight. But the Bible says to us, run with endurance. And the Bible is filled with stories of hope and characters that overcome hardship and trials, and these stories are meant to stir us and stir our faith and inspire us to face our own trials and battles with unwavering courage. Yet it seems to me that very few of those stories are told in our churches and told by our people. And I've often wondered why it is that people who seem, according to me, to have so much faith in my own estimation, oftentimes don't see the victory or receive their breakthrough. I sometimes look at people and I see, but this person has tremendous faith. And too often I've seen those same people who I looked at and I saw, geez, but these people are amazing and they're full of faith and I've seen them fall by the wayside and I've seen them not complete their race and I wondered why it was. 
And it challenges me because I'm always believing for, I'm always believing with people that they would see and receive or experience what they're trusting God for. And that's sometimes be the burden of what a pastor carries is we're believing so many times for so many people. And then a lot of times these people don't see their breakthrough or they don't receive their victory or they don't receive their miracle. And we wonder why. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're in that place and you're wondering why it hasn't happened for you and why you haven't seen your breakthrough. And it might be the analyst in me trying to figure out God and how He responds to our circumstances. But I do find it fascinating. It does stir in me because even before I was saved, I always had a hope that things would be better. I always somehow saw a better future and better things. And when I got saved, that even grew more intensely in me. That I'm always believing for God to do better things, to do greater, greater things, and for God to bring breakthrough. And so I've taken it upon myself this morning to analyze, according to God's Word, the ingredients that I believe are key in overcoming the battles in life that we face and enduring through challenging times and running and completing our race. In 1971, a young 17-year-old German girl Julian Kupka boarded a plane in Lima, Peru with her mother. And shortly after takeoff, they encountered a storm. And their plane was surrounded by thick black clouds and they were being hit by lightning. And as people were weeping and screaming in the plane, her mother held her hand. And Julianne remembers seeing a bright light coming from one of the engines. And she heard her mother say, this is the end. It's all over. Next thing Julianne remembers is the plane going into a nosedive. Everything was pitch black, and all she could hear was the roaring of the plane engines and people screaming and shouting frantically. When she looked again, she was tumbling through the sky, hurtling headfirst towards a canopy of trees, still strapped to her seat with the wind rushing and whistling in her, he in her ear. When Julianne wakes up, she's staring up into the forest canopy. She survived the plane crash. Julianne Kupka survived in the Amazon jungle as a young 17-year-old girl for 11 days without her glasses, with a ruptured knee, a broken collarbone, and maggots feasting on her wounds. She endured all of this in a little white mini dress, one sandal, and a packet of sweets for food. She endured through the harshest of elements on her own, and live to tell the tale. And she is still alive till this day. What did it take for a 17-year-old girl to survive a plane crash? And three kilometers up in the air, their plane disintegrated. And she was still strapped to her seat and she fell to the sky into the Amazon jungle and she lived and she survived for 11 days. Living off sweets. There are many stories of people thrust into similar situations that don't make it. Why is it then that some make it and some don't? Does God decide, okay, you're going to make it and you're not going to make it? I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe God sits out there and says, okay, you're going to go through a challenging time. You're going to make it. You're not going to make it. I don't believe that's how God sits and looks at us. I don't believe that's who our God is. I believe our, the heart of our God is for every one of us to make it through our battles, for every one of us to be victorious, whatever it is we face. But I believe everyone can endure if they'll just learn how to. And key to the story of Julianne surviving the plane crash and surviving in the jungle for 11 days is found in how she was raised. Julianne's parents were biologists and ornithologists, and she was raised in the Peruvian jungle for periods of her life as a young girl while also attending school. And in her book, she recounts how the things she'd learned from her father and the things she observed her parents do came to her mind as she faced various situations. 
As a 17-year-old, she was able to respond to her situation based upon what she had learned as a young girl. And even though she was afraid and, and at times thought she was hallucinating and that she was going to die, she endured and she survived because of the experiences she had with her parents while growing up. And this is what the Bible says in James 1. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. One of our greatest challenges as human beings is that we want to avoid any form of discomfort at any cost as we see it as a hindrance to the perfect life we're working so hard to obtain. Isn't that true? Everything we do in our flesh and everything we do in this life is to get to a certain point so that we are more comfortable to avoid certain challenges, to avoid certain hardships. That's the human nature. That's the nature of our emotions. That's the nature of our flesh. I'm pretty sure Julianne would have much preferred a comfortable life in the city that most young girls her age enjoyed. However, I don't think any city girl would have been able to survive a plane crash and last 11 days in the Amazon jungle. Her entire life, Julianne was being prepared for those 11 days that she would spend fighting for her life and fighting for survival. Think about that. Her entire life, she might have been frustrated being in the jungle where all the other girls are going out, meeting boys, and doing all kinds of things that teenagers do. But here's Julianne in a jungle whose parents are biologists and ornithologists, and they're looking at birds and plants and all kinds of things. But she never knew for one second, I don't believe she ever thought that she would end up in the situation that she ended up in. But as she recalls, every moment in that jungle, every circumstance she faced, she remembered what she had learned and what she had seen her parents do. Your life right now is preparation ground for some of the biggest battles you are yet to face. You can try and buy your way out and manipulate your way out of it and avoid situations that you're not comfortable facing down. But down the line, you're going to be ill-prepared, lacking wisdom to face your test if you try and avoid the things you're facing right now. And I say this because that's what we do. We try and avoid things because we don't like them. Because they're not comfortable. Because it doesn't feel nice. And that's why the Bible says, for rich people, it's as difficult as going to the eye of a needle. Trying to get them into the kingdom to trust in God because they have their wealth and their riches that they can trust in doesn't make sense to them to trust in God. Because when you are wealthy and you have a lot of money, your money can do anything for you. And it doesn't make wealthy people bad. It just means what the Bible says, it's hard for them to really trust in God. Because if circumstances don't turn out the way you want, you can pack up your family and leave South Africa. But what if that's not God's will for your life? But your money can do that for you making you think a little bit. Amen. I have no issue with people that leave this country and God's called them to and they're following a, a certain plan and course for their life. But that's why the Bible speaks of these things. So we want to avoid the discomfort of building a nation and then leave because our money can do that for us. And this year even, records amount, record amounts of people have left South Africa because their money can do that for them. But that's not always God's will for you. God said to Isaac, stay in the land of famine. Stay in the place of recession. Stay in the place where it's difficult. And in that place, God blessed him a hundredfold. You know, funny enough, I had friends years ago that upped and left South Africa, and they still 
living in Bristol, I think it is. And the reason they left was they had those years. I mean, I think it was in 2002 or 2003, around about there. And the reason they left was because of the crime and uh, uncertainty, etc. And the one day I asked them, I said, but what happened to you? And they said, no, nothing happened to them. They'd never been a victim of crime. And they'd never been a victim of any of the things that they were leaving the country for. And they weren't in London for a year. And someone broke into their house in London and stole all their stuff. Now again, I've got no issue with people in South Africans and other places. Please just hear my, what I'm saying to you. Don't avoid the place where God's placed you because it's not comfortable. God's got a purpose in that. And whatever you're facing right now, you have to tell yourself that this is preparing me for greater things. And you have to say to yourself that I'm learning skills that will come in handy someday. You have to motivate yourself that whatever it is you're going through, that you are gaining experience for your greatest victories. That's how you have to look at these challenges. That's how you have to look at these situations that you're going through, that maybe I'm learning something in this moment that is going to help me ahead in life. But you want to bypass the process. And you might get to that place where you face this battle, and then you're not adequately equipped because you avoided it. And what James is telling us is that every test, every trial, every battle, and every situation is developing our capacity to endure. And God is building you to an endurance machine. Romans 5 verse 3 verse 4, which is our scripture verse I'm reading from the Amplified Version. And it says, and not only this, but with joy. Let us exult in our sufferings and rejoice in our hardships, knowing that hardship Distress, pressure, trouble produces patient endurance and endurance proven character, which is spiritual maturity and proven character, hope and confident assurance of eternal salvation. You see, if we reverse engineer or deconstruct the scripture, then we'll see that what gives us the ability to have hope in trying times is our capacity to endure. The level to which you are able to have hope is directly linked to your level of endurance. Think about that. We say people have lost hope sometimes. Isn't it true? When we speak of people in statistical terms, we say, oh, this one has lost hope and this one didn't make up because they gave up hope. People give up hope because they aren't able to endure any longer. Because the Bible says we have this hope in Jesus Christ. Hope doesn't change. We always have hope. And people lose hope actually because they can't endure. Well, it's going fast, Peyton. Trials are what shape you. Your trials will either destroy you or develop you, and you determine that, not God. The way you look at your trials will either destroy you or develop you, and you determine that. Now, I don't know what it is you're facing right now, but according to the conversation you have in your head and your heart, will determine the outcome of that situation. The process of God improving your endurance through trials, He's also shaping your character, your spiritual maturity. To God, it's way more important who you are becoming than what you are gaining. Because we do all these things religiously and in the charismatic world, it's prevalent that sometimes everything we do for God and everything we do for church and for people and for leaders and for pastors is sometimes to gain something, forgetting that actually God is also 
interested in developing your character as a human being. It's not just about what we gain, it's about who we become. The world measures people by a different standard than God. God is way more interested in people's character than they care to know. Spend more time developing your character than developing your image. And one day your image will line up with your character. Because image is who people perceive you to be. And character is who you really are. And that's what social media does to us. We see an image of a person that they want us to see. But after the pictures put up and the posters written, who are you really? After you've edited your photo, made everybody feel bad at the wonderful life you're living, who are you really? That's just an image. And we live so much to portray an image, to fit in, to look a certain way. But I say, as God says, live to develop your character and your image will take care of itself. Amen? Hebrews 10, 36. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. The writer in Hebrews encourages us as Christians that what we need to do right now in our situation, whatever it may be, is to patiently endure. Your promise is on the other side of your patience. Stop trying to bypass the process because you're delaying your growth. You're delaying your promise. You know, some of the biggest mistakes I've made in life have come as a result of impatience. Anyone relate to that? And they cost me time and they cost me heartache and they cost me difficulty. They even cost me money. And we think patience is a small matter, but it's a very big deal to God. And God develops your patience and grows your patience through trials, through challenges, through suffering. Be very careful when you ask God to give you patience. Because on the other side of that prayer is a challenge that is going to test your patience. But it's also going to grow your patience. If you face it by faith. I mean, patience is so important to God that it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. As you read last week in Galatians, now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. There it is, patience. A fruit of the Spirit that we have to carry if we are going to make it in this life. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 5, it says, May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. Every test, every trial, and every delay is building your patience and leading you closer to Jesus Christ. Instead of trying to manipulate the situation to work out the way you want it to, wait patiently on God. You don't want to give birth to an Ishmael because you can't wait for Isaac. What does that mean? Pastor, brought no dip. Because Abraham and Sarah are becoming frustrated in trying to give birth to a child, Sarah in her frustration said to Abraham, well, take my servant and sleep with her and maybe she will give you a child. And the servant did give him a child. And that child was Ishmael. And because of jealousy and frustration, the child and mother were cast out and cast away. 
And Ishmael grew up and raised some of the tribes that would become Israel's greatest enemies. And still to this day, Israel is battling the tribes that were birthed out of Ishmael. Still to this very day, because Abram couldn't wait and be patient, they gave, gave birth to Ishmael, and Ishmael became an enemy of the promise. Don't let your present wants become an enemy of your promised future. Because what you want right now might seem like it will make things better, but it can become an enemy to your promised future. Every time we pursue what we want for what God has, we're saying to God, we don't trust Him to do what He said He would. We're saying, well, we can do it better than God. I'm saying this because that was who I was. And sometimes I still am to a degree. I've gained a little wisdom in this area of my life. But a lot of times I bypass certain processes and I pursued certain things because I couldn't wait. Or I believed that God wasn't quite clear on what was happening. So I had to help Him. And it ended up being some of my greatest mistakes and my greatest regrets. God knows what He's doing. God knows you. And the key to your breakthrough is trusting God. And then having patient endurance through your trial, your setback, your uncertainty, your doubt, your confusion, your hurt, your disappointment, your loss, your failure, your brokenness, etc., etc., etc. Whatever you want to put in that gap, you have to trust in God. The Bible says, lean not on your own understanding. Because you have a limited understanding. You might think you know it all, but you don't. Every great man and every woman that God used had to trust Him in the process. They had to endure difficulty. And they had to patiently persevere. And that's what we have to do as a people. Proverbs 3 verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not depend on your own understanding. Because we sometimes think we know better than God, isn't it? It is so. But God sees your life from beginning to end. And He knows exactly where you need to be. And He knows exactly what you need to have for who you are right now. You know, some of my, one of my favorite bands in my BC days was U2. And in that song of theirs, It's a Beautiful Day, there's a verse that goes, what you don't have, you don't need it now. And that's the truth that we should settle in ourselves, that what you don't have right now, you don't need. Because part of the pressure that we face in pursuing things that we shouldn't be pursuing it's because of the pressure that people put on us. So we see so-and-so doing this, and so we see so-and-so going there, and we see so-and-so getting that. And then we think, but well, we need to have that, but we need to be there, we need to go there, and we try and catch up. Comparison will rob you of joy and suck all the life out of you. If you compare yourself to people and try and keeping up with the Joneses. I read a book on financial stewardship. And in it, the author's name is Dave Ramsey. And he says, people buy stuff they don't need with money they don't have to impress people they don't like. Isn't that like us sometimes? To try and fit in. 
can try and maintain an image. You try and get into a certain crowd or get in with a certain group. We bypass certain things in our life. That we do certain things to get to certain places. And it's completely out of the will of God. Don't live like that. As Paul, the Apostle Paul said, be content in all seasons. Doesn't mean you sit on your backside and you don't do anything. You still have to get up, work hard, live by faith, apply, apply biblical principles. But the Bible's very clear at the right time. To everything, there's a time. To everything, there's a season. To everything, there's a purpose. At the right time, God will get you to where you need to be. If you live by faith, follow His Word, live by His Spirit, apply His principles, I guarantee you, you'll get to where you need to be. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him enjoyed the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. You still have a long way to go. And I want to say to you, God is not done with you yet. Your best days are still ahead of you. Your greatest victories are still to be won. Your biggest breakthrough is still coming. And God has a plan for your life and you have a great future in Him and He will deliver on His promises. You have to believe that in spite of what you're facing. And I know it's hard sometimes. Because I've been through some challenging seasons in my life and every time I think I'm not going to make it and every time I want to give up but then I hold on just a little bit longer. And just like Abraham who against hope in hope believed. If you can just endure a little bit longer, you'll see it. Keep your eyes on Jesus and everything He stood for. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't be distracted by everything that's going around you. Don't be as someone that lives by circumstance. The economy is doing this. The rand's doing that. The petrol's doing this. The interest rate's doing that. Inflation's doing this. This politician did that. And that politician said this. And then we try and live by these things, and it just puts you on a very uncomfortable roller coaster ride. We not deny reality. Those things happen all the time, but they're going to happen as long as the earth remains. But we have this anchor of hope in Jesus. And as we look to Him, He will stay and keep us on the course of where we need to be. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57, it says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a born-again Christian here this morning, you have to know that in the end of this book, we win. You have the victory. Jesus says He has overcome. You've already won. You just need to enforce that victory. Just grit your teeth. Put your head down and go through this. Don't try and bypass it. It serves a purpose right now, and it serves a purpose for your future. Finally, in closing, as Julianne recounts her story of how she survived, and she remembered something her father once told her. And he said to her that if she ever should be stranded or lost in the jungle that she should find a stream 
and follow it downstream to wherever it leads. And that she will be rescued. And as she was walking through that jungle, she managed to find that stream. And she followed it. And it led her to people who would rescue her. And as I read that, reminded of what God said, Psalm 23 verse 2, it says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me to be still st beside still water. Julianne found her way following those waters to a village of people who would rescue her. God's saying to you this morning that He will lead you beside still waters. Maybe you're stranded in the jungle of life right now. Then I want to encourage you. Follow the leading of His Word. If you don't know what to do, just put your head in this thing. Live by His Spirit. And He will bring you safely to where you need to be. Because He leads you by still waters. I promise you, I can't tell you the outcome of your situation. But I can promise you, if you follow God, and if you pursue Him, if you live upon His Word and you meditate upon it and you spend time in His Spirit, you build a relationship with Him, He will lead you exactly to where you need to be. You won't have to worry for one second of one day in spite of what you're facing. And I'm testimony to that because over the course of 15 years, I've taken detours and done some things that I shouldn't have done. And gone off the path that God had for me, but because I pursued Him, He brought me back to where I needed to be. You're never too far off to come back to the place where God's called you to. Never. And don't think it's the end, and don't think God can't do it for you. He can. I promise you He can. I promise you He will. Just stay the course. I really feel this in my heart to say this to you because I know there are people battling many things because it's human nature to battle things. And I say this because sadly over the years I've seen many people fall out of the race. Leave God's church and leave God's presence and leave God's, leave God's people. And they end up worse than they were before they came to know Jesus. Don't you be that statistic. It might be a battle right now, but fight it out. You have more in you than you realize. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you to face everything that you're facing right now. Run with endurance. Just endure a little bit longer. Let God develop your character. Hold on to hope. And I guarantee you pretty soon, you'll get to the place where God's called you to. Amen. You received that this morning? Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet as we close off this morning. Come on, I want every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around this morning. Come on, no one looking around. Just you and God this morning. Just you and God. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. The leaders are praying this morning. I hope this message spoke to you. Because this is a message that I try to live by every day. And I can honestly tell you, I would not have lived to the point I am right now. And been able to go through the things I've been through if it weren't for Jesus. The Bible calls him the author and the finisher of our faith. And I was out there in the world trying to live my life and trying to fight my battles, but I was fighting them on my terms and 
fighting them according to my feelings. And the moment I got born again and I got saved, I had Jesus fighting in my corner. I had Jesus fighting with me. I had Jesus fighting for me. And this is what you need right now. You need Jesus because whatever you're facing right now, you're not going to see it through on your own. That's why Jesus died. He said, I've died and I've come to give you life and come to give it to you more abundantly. The life that you're living right now is only a glimpse of what it is and what it can be. But once you have Jesus, you'll open your eyes to the possibilities that there are out there with Him. And you'll have an ability in Jesus Christ to endure certain things, to face certain things with certainty, even though it might be hard. But I want to tell you this morning, you need Jesus. God sent us a Savior in Jesus because He knew we couldn't save ourselves. And you this morning, you can't save yourself. You can't fix yourself. And you can go see all the greatest men and women, all the best motivational speakers and the greatest psychologists and psychiatrists, and they'll help you to a degree, but they cannot save your soul. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can give you certainty of salvation. Only Jesus can give you hope. Only Jesus can guarantee you enter into heaven one day. Only Jesus can do that. I never knew that. I never believed that. But became a day when I heard this message about Jesus Christ, when I heard the good news. And when I heard it, I believed it. And I confessed it. And my life forever changed. Maybe that's you this morning. You heard this message and you realize you need change. You realize you need Jesus. The Bible says you must be born again. The Bible says there's no way to the Father unless through the Son, Jesus. There's no other way into heaven but by Jesus. And it's a simple decision, but it has profound consequences. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. That's how simple it is. You just have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You just have to believe that He died and rose again for you. And you just have to confess it. And then all your sins will be forgiven. You'll become a child of God. You'll enter into a glorious future and a glorious hope. But you have to decide. But maybe I'm speaking to you, and maybe I'm speaking to someone. You've gone off the path like I did. And you realize you have to come back. You're not in a good place. And you're trying to fix it with all kinds of things. And it's not working. That hole's just getting deeper and deeper. And it's just getting darker and darker. And you realize you have to come back. You've lost your way, and you need to get back onto the road. That happens to us sometimes, and there's no shame in it. It happened to me a few times. And I had to come back, but here I am, because God is faithful. Even though we leave or become distracted, He's always waiting for us to return. And this morning, Jesus is waiting for you to return. Just like the Father stood on the road every day waiting for the prodigal son to return, God is waiting for you to return. Not to shame you, not to ridicule you, not to blame you, but to love you. Because when the prodigal returned, the father put a robe over him and a ring on his finger. And they had a celebration. And that's how God feels about you. You might be in a place of shame. But that's not how God feels about you. He loves you unconditionally. And he's calling you back. Saying, come to me. Come to me. Maybe that's you this morning. I want to pray for you. You need Jesus. You realize you need to come back to the place that you left. If that's you this morning, right there where you stand, won't you slip up your hand and say, that's me, pray with me. Just lift up your hand high and say, that's me, pray with me. Just lift your hand so I can see. So that I can see. Just lift your hand high and say, that's me, I need Jesus. I need to come back. I want to walk this walk. I want to run this race with endurance. I need Jesus. Amen. Look up at me.
just feel I want to, maybe there's, everybody is saved in this place. And that's fine. But I believe this is a message in season for many of you. So I don't care who you are. You might be a leader in this place. You might be a prominent person, whoever you are. If you're facing some things right now, you need God to intervene. You're battling through some things. Just on the altar, just leave your seat. Come and stand in the front here. Let me just come and pray with you. That's you. Come on, just step out of your seat. I know everybody is facing something. Don't be, don't be prideful now. Step out of your seat. Come and stand here. And let God just touch you for a moment so you can see again. Amen. So come on, step out of your seat. Step out of your seat. Come on. Let me just pray with you. Come on. That's you this morning. Step. Step. Come stand here. Come stand so we can pray. Come on, I know there's more of you. Just step out of your seat. Step out of your seat this morning. Come and stand here this morning.